So welcome to the Quality of Mind Transforming Business podcast. This is where we explore the new game-changing understanding that can unlock new levels of performance, resourcefulness, and well-being in the workplace. Join us if you want to be part of the new breed of leaders in business. Join us if you're fed up with the conventional echo chamber. And join us if you want to be part of the new revolution in understanding how the mind works and recognize that we are more than just our psychology and that that can lead to better results. Hello and welcome to the Quality of Mind Transforming Business podcast series. So today I've got another conversation lined up and I think this is going to be really interesting because my guest, Lula Benz, is an expert in trauma therapy. And you might be thinking, well, what's this got to do with business? But it's got everything to do with the mind and therefore there will be relevance, which we will tie in in the podcast to business. But Lou, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Piers. Thanks for inviting me and lovely to be here. Well, I'm really looking forward to this because we've been on each other's radars for quite a few years, but never really sat down to have a good chin wag. So here we are. Lou, do you mind giving listeners just a a minute or two on your background just to set the scene? Okay, of course. Um, Well, I've been a therapist for about 20 years now. Um, My previous life was in the rag trade and radio. So in business before I went into rehab and I worked at the Priory which is an addictions unit really in Roehampton for about 10 years and then latterly the last 10 years I've been more focused on trauma. Right well I mean you've got a wealth of experience and I sometimes see your posts and think yes she's a wise woman Um, so it's great that uh, you're on here to have a chat with us because we thought we might theme this conversation around a topic that is um, relevant to the workplace and that is psychological safety because it's talked about quite a lot nowadays within the workplace that people don't have that sense of psychological safety Um, and one of the reasons I'm so excited by this conversation or looking forward to it is because I think we might have some maybe some quite different views (laughs) on it but I think there also will be a meeting of minds as well and I always love a different view because I think it really helps us explore and hopefully listeners as a Uh, fellow explorers will also find some insight so um, are you up for a conversation about psychological safety I'm totally up for a conversation about psychological safety yes and I'm very much looking forward to debating the similarities and the differences that we might have in our schools of thought because I think there are more similarities in our backgrounds peers than you think because actually prior to being a therapist I was an NLP master practitioner a clinical hypnotherapist and I did my coach training well that for for, for listeners that know me they'll know I've been there too had that t-shirt and for people that don't know me yeah I had 10 years in that space of being an NLP or a hypnotherapist and a coach so well that's interesting isn't it so so, and I love the way particularly in our our profession how, how careers evolve because it does come down to what you see yourself. Because what once I had my sort of ahas back in 2010, I couldn't really carry on coaching and working from the NLP modality because I saw something different. And if you'd asked me this question about psychological safety 10 years ago, I would have given you a completely different answer to now, even probably different to five years ago. Um, I'm not trying to sound fickle here, listeners. It's just that things evolve in what you see. So, how interesting. So Lou, do you want to start us off and just give your view on how you would describe psychological safety and what that is? How would I describe psychological safety now? So I'm afraid I do see a lot of things through a trauma lens. Now, yes. if I was to say it in in I suppose more business language, I would say that I see everything through a nervous system lens. Yes. So working with a nervous system is, I think, what I term things as now. I don't I don't get the terminology of mental health. Mm-hmm. I don't even understand what mental is. And if you <laughs> ask me to point to mind again, yes. I get a little bit lost. 
Yes. But I don't get lost with the nervous system. Right. You know, and I mean, I, I even don't get lost with the nervous system now because I can feel my own nervous system in this moment. You know, it doesn't matter how many podcasts and interviews I do. I can always feel that there is a part of me or an element that feels a little bit more activated. And I'm not saying that I'm totally in my sympathetic arousal, but I'm not as laid back and in my parasympathetic rest and digest and calm, which is what I felt I was maybe in half an hour ago, for example. So for me, psychological safety is all about the nervous system. And I would frame psychological safety through the lens of the nervous system in something called the polyvagal theory, Mm -hmm. which I know some people have said has been disputed, but I think 95% of people would say that Stephen Porges polyvagal theory is a good way to see psychological safety within somebody's nervous system. And is it something you can give us a minute gist of, or does it not yeah. really fit with gist? Yeah, I can give you a minute of. I'll try and, and I'll try and do it as succinctly as I possibly can. Thank you. So the polyvagal theory says that as human beings, basically, we have three modes of operating, and they're all based on the vagus nerve that runs down the back from the back of the neck, um, head, through the back all the way down and it sits through all of our organs and Stephen Porges the founder of it says that we operate really as human beings out of three waves or phases like on a ladder of that polyvagal system and at the top of the ladder when we're in our flow state and our adult and our functional what I would call our real authentic self we're in green Mm -hmm. So in green, we're calm, we're connected, we're curious, we're collaborative, we're in our lovely ventral vagal flow state. But as soon as we start to notice somebody looks at us in a different way, we see something weird, we feel triggered within us, something happens in our internal system or our external system that goes "Mm, pay attention danger we start to become activated into our sympathetic arousal so our heart rate elevates a bit we're a bit more anxious a Mm -hmm. bit more agitated and if that doesn't work if that doesn't calm us or it doesn't get us into fight or flight or getting out of the situation we then go into the bottom of the ladder which is called dorsal vagal collapse where we basically have gone from amber sympathetic into our red system where our vagus nerve has gone you're in total danger now and we either freeze or we flop or sometimes we try and befriend the attacker or what we see as the danger signal and our nervous system is doing that all the time through threats of safety or threats of danger am I feeling safe am I feeling in danger and we all have different cues Mm. because when we're in green our social engagement system is on And we're feeling okay. When we start to go into amber and red, we're already, we're not able to engage. We're not able to connect. We're not able to process. And in red, we've dissociated. Now, everything you've said there absolutely fits. Different language to what I would use completely. Oh, is it? But um, everything runs true there in what you said in terms of I could, I see that in, in people. Now we happen in quality of mind to use a language called aperture. Right. Expansion so like or contraction. Wide, wide mind. I yeah. Think. And, yeah. and sort of in contraction would be like your collapse, you know, down the bottom there where people re- retreat back into themselves. And whereas an expanded aperture were full of flow and joy and love and et cetera, et cetera. So I'm, I'm with you on that. That yeah, it's all, 
everything you're saying, I go, yeah, understand that, understand that. Um, language is different, of course, but it, I think that's how it turns. I, I think it turns up. The nervous system is a great way of describing it. So, and if we just take it back to psychological safety in the workplace, what we're saying here is that if people are not in what you would call your green zone in the workplace, then one, they're not going to enjoy work very well. Two, yeah. you're not going to get the best out of them. And three, the organization is going to suffer because of that, because, Absolutely. you know, so it's really obvious to see how this is relevant for every aspect of life, in, including work. And isn't it fascinating that in the workplace, it just so seems to be that people can what they would describe as get triggered from that green into into that collapse by um or let's call it a difficult boss or yeah. a pressure in a project or a whatever it is. And then they don't feel that psychological safety. Therefore, they're not enjoying it. They're not performing at their best. And hey, presto, the organization's not working. Totally agree with you 100%. Yeah. And, and the organizations yeah. seem to be the way they run some of them, trigger that fight or flight. And rather than the opposite, which is what, you know, but everyone in the workplace has probably had examples of both where they've been in a beautiful team and they feel you know, they can bring their best, they can be who they are, they can admit mistakes, they can be vulnerable, they can bring ideas, they can question things. And people have probably had experiences of where the opposite is the case where they just go, uh oh, better just keep my head down here and try and just survive, um, etc. Yeah. So with you with you. Now, this could be interesting. The next question I'm going to ask you is, what do you think we need to do about that? Okay, well, being a trauma therapist, and I know the word trauma, everybody um, probably has a bit of an ab reaction to, particularly in business. It might have got slightly better since COVID, mm. because to a lot of people's nervous systems, COVID has been a trauma. Yeah. Um, but trauma in the sense of, can I just define trauma a bit? Please, Have please I got do. time? Mm. So trauma really a lot of people think is a one-off massive you know tsunami or 9-11 or Manchester bombing or it's elements of PTSD or being in a war zone and yes those are one-off single incident traumas but I tend to deal very much more with something called developmental trauma and those are the relational experiences with our primary caregivers, usually, or those close to us, where we grew up in, in an environment where we weren't emotionally held, or mm -hmm. there was an experience of our nervous systems not being scaffolded against somebody else's nervous system that could co-regulate us and soothe us. So we developed a kind of developmental early childhood trauma of neglect, sometimes abuse, sometimes abandonment. And so when we have that in our zero to six age period unfortunately as human beings we develop these beliefs about or core beliefs about ourselves and very often those beliefs are then what we carry through into our adulthood mm -hmm. and teenage years and we call those limiting beliefs mm -hmm. so for a for a developmental trauma Obviously, you can have that early childhood trauma and attachment trauma, we call it too. But then you can also have other traumas on top of it yep. or other bullying or other experiences in your perhaps teenage or later years that were really invalidating. So those core beliefs get even more compounded because, as you know, you know, uh, neurons that fire together, wire together. And the more that we believe something about ourselves, the more those paths get trodden. Now, trauma therapy and trauma healing and the likes of Gabor Mate or Bessel van der Kolk or Peter Levine of Somatic Experiencing, who are all big in the trauma field, would say that those beliefs aren't held in mind. Mm -hmm. They're not held in our brain. Unfortunately, they're held within our body and our mm -hmm. nervous system. So I usually believe in working very much with 
the body and what we call the soma or the somatic mm. and using techniques that help us to de- dissolve those limiting core beliefs so that we're not triggered anymore back in our nervous system. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Well, fascinating. So absolutely, you know, I would agree that I've been coaching for 20, 20 plus years and yes, people present with all sorts of narratives about the world. And a lot of that comes from when they were younger, et cetera, et cetera. And you can, and, and you can see, feel it in the body, you know, it's even how some people breathe and the, and the nervous. So uh, yeah, I'm, I'm with you on that. Now, what's interesting for me is probably 10 years ago when I went from the world that you were, we were in together, sort of the NLP and that kind of world into where I am now, that's where it changed for me because what I started to see, and this will be interesting to to see how how this lands for you, Lou, but is that whereas in the past I would, if there was a limiting belief or, or something, there was, there was a host of tools and techniques I would use, some, some hypnosis or some timeline or, or some EFT or whatever. Um, now where I would point people is to go via a, a realization shift to dissolve that belief. And, and it's a meta realization about any type of belief, not that particular belief they might have, but about any sense of narrative or belief. And that is to see that we've all innocently, invisibly got the wrong end of the stick or be mistaken as to what we are right so if we believe we are this self this peers or this Lou or this whoever it is and that's all we are then the self needs to protect itself from the world that turns up on the screen of perception and it's really understandable why we'd create these alert mechanisms to come in and try and protect ourselves which may at one point in time have been valuable but aren't now but are still playing out and get triggered by x y and z but the meta realization i would be asking people to inquire into is and this for for regular listeners this will make sense and for new listeners just just bear with this for a moment is is to start to inquire through direct experience and this is really key when i say through direct experience not through knowledge or concepts but through direct experience i.e what you actually can experience see feel and perceive in the moment as to what we are now you might mean what do you what do you mean what we are what's a, what an odd question who are we you know because what you start to see through direct experience is we've never actually experienced anything outside of what i'm going to call the mind and I realize the mind is a big, broad word that some people mean brain, some people mean that. But what I mean is we've never, ever experienced anything directly outside of our experience. So this idea that there's this world made of matter, molecules and atoms and trees and buses and people, we've only ever experienced through the mind. Right. So if that's the case, where does it really appear? We've been told by science in the last 300 years that it appears in what we would call this out there, you know, in in, in this world, and that what you are is a perceiver of this world. Now, through direct experience, you can go, well, actually, I've never experienced it outside of the mind, and no one has. No scientist, no mystic, no, no one has experienced the world outside of the mind. And also people can point to the fact that They've had times when just maybe little glimpses of moments where they have really felt a sense of oneness and and they are part of nature or when you fall in love, you're there's something bigger than us. We we got a we got a a sense of something bigger than us. We don't often feel that in today's world, but there's a sense of there's something. So we've got this idea that no one's ever experienced anything outside the mind. We've got this that there's something bigger than us. Or, or, or we are not the epicenter. Yeah. And we start to see that some of our beliefs will just dissolve by themselves. Yeah. Where do they go? And some of them seem to stick around. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so it's like, yeah. I can't, if I think about every belief I've had in my life, why haven't I got all those? Right. And how come some stick and some don't stick? So there is an almost like an automated dissolving process that happens through the system. 
right? Yeah. And to me, what seems to happen is that when we self-identify with ourself as an entity, when we self-identify with our narrative, it kind of holds them in place, right? Yeah. Now, when the system, for whatever reason, it does this through what I would describe as an expansive aperture, though it, 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 it there's a space we can get to where disease, beliefs just dissolve by themselves. Now, in the old days, I was very good at kind of digging into beliefs and trying to find out how to get rid of them and swim around in them. And if you swim around them enough, they might fall over, you know, and you're waiting for that Jenga piece, you know, the game Jenga, and you pull the piece out and pop, right? But now what I see is the more that we recognize what we truly are pre the self, Right, the impersonal us, if you want to call it that, the more these beliefs just seem to disappear off, right? And the lovely thing about that is that you don't need to necessarily poke them and get into them and, and, and really understand them at a conceptual intellectual level. They can just dissolve off, which is why I think you said it beautifully earlier. Everyone's in individual in what triggers them and what doesn't trigger them and what, what, things hang around from past let's call it trauma it will affect people differently so you could have three people in the same upbringing and they're all going to have slightly different takes or completely different takes so are, are you you sort of with me i've covered a lot lou are you still with me a little bit i am i am with you and i and you know if i can reflect back some of what's coming up for me um you know as i'm with you is Yes, I agree that there is a bigger aperture. And yes, I agree that there is a soul self or a spirit or that there is a quantum universe out there in which, you know, molecules and cells are just molecules and cells. And if we could all be in what, you know, one duality, you know, I've spent lots of times in ashrams I've spent lots of times mm. with Muji yes. and Eckhart Tolle and, and many other spiritual gurus who uh, lead the non-duality existence and coming from one and I think for certain people at certain points in the journey absolutely it's where it's where mm. it's where profound healing works but i've also seen an awful lot of people spiritually bypassing mm -hmm. using non duality as a way for them to not be of the body and in the body so they don't have to yeah. um feel any of the pain body they can just disengage from it and come from a higher position and not through the body and yes. and you know that in is interesting for me for the very much the same gurus of non-duality of who will remain nameless still have issues with sex addiction maybe or food addiction or sugar or other things in their body that for me I feel haven't been dissolved and yeah. haven't been processed have just been disconnected from and I, I would agree with that I would agree with that and I think because you're right in that and I would say that the, the key for me uh, and this is why you need to people need to just tread their path in a way that is, is understanding of this is that spiritual bypassing is a fascinating topic isn't it because yeah. to me that happens when someone has sort of conceptually and intellectually identify with the idea of it oh that's nice i'll be that right but they haven't really had the realization and they and there is a part of non-duality uh that if you only and spirituality that you know the, the the vedanta path can sometimes take people just into that slightly aloof disconnected um spiritual bypassy way now when you look at other the other side of it which i which i would call the tantra which i wouldn't call it that's just what referred to it is being of this world being in the body welcoming feelings and sensations but right? not to go oh i am not you i am not feeling i am not sensation 
you need the Vedanta and the Tantra to give the technical names, right? Otherwise, you can end up in that slightly sticky bit where <laughs> you can kind of say the right things, but actually at a felt level, at a felt level, the world still feels a bit icky. Yeah. Right? Now, to me, if the world still feels a bit icky, I don't care what you know or who you think you are or what spiritual high and flutingness you go on about, ain't, it ain't working. Right. <laughs> because if you don't feel more lightness, contentment and connection in life, then it hasn't done anything. Yeah. So I hear what you say about that, that spiritual bypassing thing. I also recognize that there's no way, you know, I would ever go up to someone who's experiencing, you know, in the middle of a triggered trauma and go, hey, can I tell you about the mind? Um it's highly unlikely I would do that <laughs> because yeah, in that I, moment, yeah. their vagus, vagus nerve is going boing, 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 boing. If there was a boing, boing, boing of it, right? That's not a technical term. Um, they need to settle and, and then the system needs to calm a bit and then maybe then you could point. So I'm not going to say this is the silver bullet for when someone's in the middle of a traumatic episode to come and tell them about the nature of the mind. Um, and I, and I know, think you're right peers because I think you need to point at the right point and and let me say more about pointing at the right point to know that mind is what mind is which is basically an illusion yeah you know first of all I think that you have to realize about the different parts of you so so let's just section mind off for a moment and mm -hmm. let's just let's just say that we've got three parts of mind for mm -hmm. example let's say that we've got our functional adult or our real self mm -hmm. and then can we say just for a moment that we've got this wounded self the mm -hmm. child self and we've got this adapted stroppy teenager self yeah yeah so if I if I've and let let's say you know one of my clients um for example had been through so much trauma and so much childhood abuse that for the first year sat in a chair opposite me, every time I moved, she would flinch. Mm -hmm. So I'm not gonna point anybody away from anything other than pointing to the fact at the moment that you've got your adult real self. Let's not speak about your soul. Let's just talk about your wider mind and your adult, your green zone. You might not feel your adult green zone is there at all because you're spending your life in your wounded yeah. child or your adapted teenager. Yeah. And the adapted teenager is going, go away, leave me alone. I don't trust anybody. I hate human beings and I hate myself. And this wounded child is in a lot of pain. Yes. I'm going to spend the first bit of my healing journey with that person, not saying you don't have a stroppy, adapted fight or flight aspect of you that hates people in the world because you've been severely abused and you don't have a traumatized inner child part that you hate. I'm going to say, I want us to try and get you to, to turn and acknowledge those different elements of you, those different parts of you, whilst realizing those are historical parts, they're old parts, they're old beliefs. They don't really, we know, exist, but they exist in somebody's nervous system because that's what twitches them, that's what frightens them and at the same time we're going to strengthen your adult we're going to speak to you when you use the word I you're talking from your adult but when you're talking about your teenager or your wounded child can you say this part of me or that part of me yeah right that yeah, part yeah, that yeah, part yeah, yeah. not I that's not yeah. you yeah who yeah. you are is not that I yes. is your functional adult. So I will do that work so that they accept those parts first and we're building the I. Once we've built the I, then we can go above it to soul, to spirit, to, 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 to non-duality. But I can't go straight there because they've got parts of them 
that in that relational healing dynamic human connection place it's almost like they do need slightly to be seen and to be heard and yeah. to be witnessed and to be held because a lot of my clients have never ever had that so I guess a question of just pure curiosity for me from what you just said right is hearing someone's narrative and them being able to express how they've seen the world occurred to them mm -hmm. the effect that that has on them being able to then let it go and for it to dissolve we cannot let go peers for me that which we do not accept so so let me explain mm -hmm. more of where I'm coming from on that. If I'm talking about us as parts or human beings as parts, you know, we've all got these different aspects of ourselves. And very often I'm, I'm, I'm understanding that I'm potentially dealing with people with more traumatic backgrounds than your audience will hopefully have had. Yeah, themselves. of course. But most of my clients, no, I'm going to say all of them, let's own and stand by this, have got inner child parts. They've got controlling parts. They've got managing parts. They've got different aspects of them that can often be different ages even. Mm -hmm. And you can see that in the room once they drop into that part of them. Now, those parts are predominantly disowned or rejected by the person themselves. They hate those parts of them. Mm -hmm. They don't want anybody else to see them. They don't want them to be acknowledged. They don't even want them to be seen. So part of my job I see as a trauma clinician is to help that person start to accept or even like, or learn to love, dare I say, eventually, those different aspects of them and see that all of their parts, whatever age they are, whether they're stroppy teenagers or seven-year-old, very fearful parts, are there for a reason and are there mostly because they're trying to help them mm -hmm. in some way. Mm -hmm. So once that person has started to acknowledge that their parts are trying to be there for their own good and they start to accept them themselves, then they can begin to let them go. Then they can begin to let the story go. Because in trauma, a lot of the healing is done in that relational repair. Can that, you say a little bit more about relational repair? Yeah. So as human beings, we are traumatized predominantly by relationships, mm -hmm. by a lack of uh, somebody bonding or hearing or seeing or being there for us. We get traumatized in relationships. And actually, as humans, we repair in relationships, in relationships where we feel safe and seen and heard and that all of our parts are seen and accepted and loved because, oh my God, if you love that awful six-year-old inner child of mine who's covered in shame, maybe she's not so bad. Or if I tell you this story about myself, as something I did when I was a teenager that I just, it is horrific to me and you accept it. And I start to feel seen and heard and witnessed and accepted. Maybe I can do that to myself. So once that person mm. has done the work of accepting their inner parts, then I believe they're then more able to follow your path. Mm. rather than disconnecting from those parts and pretending that they're not there in the first place, which is just renegating them over and over again. Yes. And I think, so that what I would hear in that is because it's that's so interesting because I wouldn't say I would tell someone, oh, they don't exist. Don't worry. You're making that up, you know, not, not doing that. But what I guess I'm pointing people 
to see is the nature of the mind and its narratives and its you could call them parts if you like you know the the, the different parts that we we form in our conditioned psychology and but we don't just form them in our psychology do we or in our mind because mind doesn't even exist we form these parts within our nervous system and our body they exist but i'm saying that's the same thing you see i'm, yeah. I'm saying mind body body mind right. okay. it's the same no it's the body it, mind really but, but body mind right so yeah. and it turns up physically visually, yeah. sensually. Yeah. Wow, you, you can definitely feel it, right? So it's it's real in, in, in how it's turning up. They're not they're not making it up. They're not you know on some kind of you know it, it's it's very real. It's visceral. It's it's in the it's what we would describe as the body. Mind to me is everything. It's it's, it's not the brain. It's w w way wider, and th things would would at a localized level of consciousness that would turn up for us like that, presenting but very very real. Now what I would point someone to see is the nature of that. The nature of that I would describe, and this is just a shortcut. So there's, 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 there's something to see behind this is, is real, but not true. So it's real in that it's, it's, it's animated. It's, it's, it's sentient, it's this all those kind of things, but it's not true in that it, that it, that it's occurring in the mind, not outside the mind, because I, I don't, there isn't an outside the mind. So it's, it's occurring in the mind in, in different moments for us. It's not as causal as we might have given it power to be, right? And it's not as permanent as we might think it was, as in, and it wasn't actually caused by the event that we've attributed it to. Now, on the screen of perception, it may well have looked like that. So event A happened, and then I had this occurrence of, of feelings and sensations and thoughts. So it would look causal, but it's not that that, that event itself has no causal power over it. And, and we know that because things can change and dissolve, right? So it, if it was causal, it would have to stay. So you're pointing someone to see the nature of the mind. And when people start to have realizations about the nature of the mind, those narratives will dissolve. Oh, if only it was so simple. Well. But I think that's almost what you're pointing to as well, in a way. It right? is, but I'm doing the whole relational piece of not saying it's not true or not caused by it. So I wouldn't say it's real, but not true. For example, if somebody had been raped or they'd been abused by a parent as a child, I'm going to stay in that relational repair and help that person to process and and I disagree in that I think beliefs are caused by events I think that when we're five six seven eight nine ten and we're taking on our beliefs about who we are in the world they're not true the negative cognitions that happen inside our own body mind are not true but we've skied down those snow slopes so many times into those grooves that we believe that they're true. But I'm yeah, not I agree with that. Go, yeah, I'm not going to yeah. go straight into challenging somebody that who in their child ego state believes because of their sexual abuse that they're bad, that that's not true. Because to that part of them, it is. So I'm going to do all the repair and the trauma work in hearing their story at the right time or processing that belief using something like EMDR or EFT and doing that relational repair piece before I start to bring them out into more of a being able to see that that narrative and that belief about themselves is not true. It's just in their child ego state, but actually they're functional adult. None of that trauma still, well, none of the cells in their body are the cells that were there at the point as a right. child that they were yeah. being traumatized. Yeah. Yeah. It's just as it, for me, it's all about timing. Yes. And I, I, yes, I, I can totally get what you say about timing because people will 
um, th they'll hear it at different levels and different different moments. So I, I I agree with you. And what because of where you're meeting people on their journey, if you want to use that phrase journey, um, there's some priming you need to do for them to be able to start to see. But if I suppose if we look at where so, so if for a moment we, we take away the fact that you're working with people that have a very different part of the journey and just look at what we see, um, there's, there's some big similarities. Um, the interesting piece I hadn't really considered particularly until you mentioned it in the way you did was around the relational piece. Um, and I think what I heard in that was that it helps. I think what I heard is so let me play it back to you and, and see whether it, it was, okay. makes sense. Is yeah. that once the self hears another self validate or, or accept um, a part, it can be easier for that self to see, well, actually, if, if that self accepts it, why can't this self accept it, right? Yeah. So, and, and if they haven't had that happen in their life very often, that might be new news for them. Now, here's an interesting piece that popped into my mind. Whereas that is a very useful thing to, to experience for them is it a crucial part of the jigsaw or just one that often works well in terms of therapy and trauma healing i would say that most therapists work through what we call an attachment lens mm -hmm. so attachment is basically our bonding with our primary caregiver between, well, the most important part is in utero to three, but then it's really naught to seven. And if we haven't had that secure maternal, usually, sometimes it can be paternal, but attachment figure in our life, we believe, and actually neuroscience and neurobiology proves that we have either a disorganized or an avoidant or an insecure, ambivalent attachment rather than a secure. And I'm not sure what the percentage is of people in the world that have a secure attachment, but I know that it's not the majority. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Fair enough. So, so most of therapy or clinical work is about, for a certain amount of time, not being the crutch or the, 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 the dependent, the making a client dependent, but being a secure, firm figure in somebody's life so that neurobiologically they can rework some of that mm. early lack of attachment where they didn't get seen they didn't get heard they didn't get a safe other presence so a lot of therapy is about this rupture and repair rupture and repair where we're creating mm. relationships with somebody so that they can start to feel secure in their relationships and that people are inherently good and that they can trust others and mm. okay interesting so so here's a question for you then just to start with it is not for trauma and therapy and, and then we'll yeah. put that back in but because the a way i would look at it around relationships because it's changed for me quite dramatically over the last sort of five ten years is that if we come back to this thing i would call this our mistaken identity about what we are I always thought I was the peers, I was the, the self, I was the, the conceptual mind, that that was what I was. And I might have a spiritual element to me somewhere, right? On a Sunday afternoon, I can get in contact with this spiritual thing. But what shifted for me is recognizing that what we are is not the self, it's not the peers or the loo, it's, it's the thing that sits behind all of that, the universal field of consciousness, you might want to call it. Right. And, 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 and that's what we are. We, we are the capacity for awareness, not the content of awareness, right? Which localizes down into a self mind that then has narratives and concepts, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So the thing that does relationships is the self, because as consciousness, I am everything. 
Yeah. I, I am one. Yeah. Right? So that can't have a relationship because to have a relationship, you have to be separate and you can't have a separate, you can't have, you know, uh, you need an A and a B and there isn't an A and B, it's one. So at one level, I am everything. I am God. I am consciousness. You want to use those words. But I'm also at a localized level, peers. Yeah. A separate self that can have a relationship with a Lou or a, or a, someone else, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And when I struggle in relationships, it's peers that's struggling in relationships, right? And when I struggle to relate to the world, it's peers that's struggling to relate to the world. Okay. So if I feel lonely and isolated and all those kind of things, that's peers. That's a localized level of peers. And whereas that's super important in the game of life, because it's nice to go around um, having friends and, and feeling loved and all that kind of thing, it's, it's not who I am, right? Because that's, that's what I, I nickname the I. So I would call the peers the self and the I is, the, is, the, is, is I consciousness. So reminding myself or, or dissolving the self, the self to see that I am I, which is what you experience when you're in true flow, you know, true, 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 true love and flow is just, just love and just oneness and everything. Um, it sh shows that actually the relationships you have at the level of peers, whereas they're important at one level, are not what you are. Now, does that make any sense at all? Yeah, it makes complete sense. Right. Yeah. So to what extent do you then point your patients to see that they are, that there's, there's a sort of, there's them at the self level that's, you know, hasn't had the loving nurturing relationships, but that's not what they are. Did, did you go to that? Like after you sort of repaired this, the, the self, is, is that what I'm pointing, what you're, what you're saying? I think that if you don't repair the cell concept, you are using I as a spiritual bypass. Oh, right. Okay. That's interesting. So you don't think people can experience I in any moment? Well, I think, yes, I do. I, but, but your I and my I is different. Your I or I is everything. I is the universe. I is others. Yeah. Is, is to me like our soul self. Okay. We've got, we've got a language thing going on here. So let's just get clear. So, uh, when I say I, the capacity for awareness, I, 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 the, I, I, the, the everything. Yeah. That's what you would call. What would you call that? Soul self. Souls self. Okay. And, and that's ever present. Yeah. That's yeah. always there to tap into. Right. So, so why then is someone's accessing that? Is that spiritual bypassing? It's spiritual bypassing if they tend to stay in the I self and they don't acknowledge any of their historical uh, what's in the body. Right. If they're using it as a springboard to go, well, actually, no, that's my I self. I, I don't need relationships. I'm I. I can, and I've seen this happen time and time again with I self. Well, I don't really need to attach to that person. I can just let all of that go. I can become what we would call an avoidant attachment and not attach to anybody. You know. Right. It, it's, it, it can be used, I think, I consciousness as a way to disengage from people and from life. And let yeah. the other it, parts are acknowledged. It, it, it can be, uh, but also... When we access relationships at the self level from I, they just come with so much more beauty, joy, and effortlessness, don't they? Because they don't have yeah. so much neediness in them and they're beautiful relationships. Yeah. But you're just coming in from another angle and I'm coming up from another angle. Once you've worked on your critical parent or your inner parts, you're coming from the adult self, what I would call the functional adult I and then you can move up but I'm just working with what's underneath the eye and is in the body 
So I suppose in the, so I suppose you're, question, you're working top down and I'm working bottom up. Well, I suppose the question I had was, um, really it was for healing that wounded self, uh, in, in a relationship, to what extent do you see them recognizing, uh, what I would call, I, what you would call soul? What, what do you see the role of that? I see the role of soul as crucial at a certain point in the journey for right. for people with trauma. I think if you bring it in too early, I'm not sure whether, like you, you believe that it can dissolve yeah. everything else. Right. Okay. And like Eckhart Tolle believes, you know, the pain body, if we don't run down those synapses or paths, just disappears. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And right. So it's it's the timing on the journey for you with when when that gets introduced sort of thing. I, I, I'm a great believer, yeah. Piers, that everything has to be approached from, okay, let's take it from a mind, body, and soul. Let's take it from that perspective. And the spiritual aspects or the one consciousness or whatever we want to call that greater force, be it yeah. God, be it cos yeah. cosmic forces, be it energy, be it oneness, be it whatever it is, has to come into the journey at some point. I'm just not sure for some people at what point yeah. it's better to access it. Yeah. And I, 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 do you know what? It's a very interesting question because if you look at, uh, and it has been for me, so you, you look at, um, again, this is just words, but the, the, the direct path, non-duality versus non-duality, right? So the stepping stone that I made, I have made many stepping stones over the last 20 years, um, you know, but when I first got in, when I first was, uh, so I was in NLP, as you know, for a long time. And, and then I came across something called the three principles. Um, I don't know if you're aware of those Sydney banks, mind, thought and consciousness. Um, and w whereas, uh, that probably was pointing quite, quite direct path, non-dual, the way it was sort of taught to me was that there was a thinker that so the world was inside out, but there was a thinker. So it added in that the self wasn't a thought, which is what I believe now. Um, but there was a, there was a, there's an entity that was the thinker, right? Um, whereas now I would see that the self is an activity of consciousness, not an entity, right? So the self is, itself is a thought. It isn't a self that has thoughts. So that, that, that was, um, a stepping stone, if you like. So when I started to see more, um, direct path, I was like, well, is that too far for my clients to go see, you know, so do I, do I need to add some concession and stepping stones in to try and point them, you know, um, and that was a big question for me. I, di I didn't know. Um, to talk about this journey and timing, really. And I suppose I just did what occurred to me to see what would happen. <laughs> uh, and you, you let your results be your, your, your guide. And I think when I've now probably five years into this sort of more direct path, non-dual, I've seen that... Um, It, it, it is a jump for people to, to go straight direct path, but in a way it was a jump to go to the fact that the, it's inside out anyway. And the nice thing about going to the direct path is, is it, it then reduces the amount of thinking people have that they need to have better thoughts. And how do I have, if it's all about thought, how do I have better thoughts? And, you know, they would put a burden on themselves. So, so the, the, the problem would go from all well, the outside world's getting me to, oh, it's my thoughts that are getting me. Right. <laughs> so actually, whereas it's, it's, it's a jump, it does clear up that bit. So it's simpler in one level. Um, but that having been said, of course, everything you do in, in, in the work we do with our clients is responsive to that client. So you're different ways for different clients. And in one-to-one -one coaching, the beautiful thing is you, you'll go at the pace, the stepping stones that that person needs when you're doing something in, you know, which is more of a group and you, you, you're a bit more transmitty, I guess you have to put it out there. So, um, I, I've been having that experiment with timing and when on the journey, do you talk about things? 
and I've over the time I've got more and more direct. Um, have I lost a few people? Probably a few, but was I losing them anyway? Maybe <laughs> it doesn't seem to, the more direct I go, it doesn't, it does seem to make it more powerful for people. That that's my experience. Now I'm not working with the people that you're working with. So just be super clear. Um, and if I was, I'm sure I'd be doing it very differently. Um, because go back to our nervous system conversation. If the nervous system's all over the shop, there's not a lot of point of talking to it about these, these more profound matters. So, but what I found is as my groundings changed and I've got more, just speak what I see. And that's something I want to ask you about that in a minute. The more I speak what I see, the power's gone up. So, so lots of questions I could ask you on that, but I'll ask you the last one first. To what extent, and I'm sure you know many therapists as well, to what extent do you think, and this is slightly to do with your relational healing piece maybe, because to me there's a magic in what we do which has nothing to do with what we're saying, right? So... <laughs> sometimes it kind of you, you say a load of old rubbish and it makes a massive difference to someone and sometimes you say something you think is brilliant and it makes no difference and you're like hang on a minute here this isn't about what I'm saying it's something about where I'm at or the the, the, the something in in the the, the the connection between us and our clients and I'd love to know what you think about that yeah actually what what we're holding and what we need to hold is that person as I, whether that I is their soul or whether that I is their, you know, if, if I'm saying it's their self energy or their, their adult or functional adult, what I'm saying is it's their flow state. So it's their yeah. connected, compassionate, curious, creative, all those beautiful C's is what we're trying to get back to. And I think what we, whatever type of clinician or coach we are, we need to hold in mind that we're seeing that. We're not seeing the slightly less functional yes. or more dysregulated, maybe is a better word, parts of them. And I, yeah. I always think that people don't pay me for the language. So I, I always think that people are paying me for my nervous system. Right. Yeah. And I, and I, and I would say my aperture, which is the same thing. Yeah. Completely the same. Yeah. And I think that's, it's so interesting you say that because I would go, yes. Yeah. So it's all the years and years and retreats and ashrams yeah. as I've spoken about and, you know, silent retreats and, and training and, you know, I, I'm not saying, as you know, Piers, I think now, I'm not saying that I'm at one consciousness or or or, or I've reached, you know, uh, Muji or Eckhart Tolle's place yet. My God, please, one day. Who knows? But then again, I might already be there and not even really. Well, I think we're all yeah. equally enlightened at one level, you know, which is how, how much of our moments we spend in that. Yeah. You know, I'd like to spend more game. time in that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's yeah. fair enough. <laughs> yeah. Because it feels quite nice when you yeah. are there. But I think that we resonate and neurobiologically we attune, don't we, to somebody else. And our job as therapists, I know, is that right brain to right brain interaction where somebody can feel that our nervous system and our right brain has done a level of depth of processing that really I can be a safe container and space for somebody else's nervous system to do what it needs to do in my presence. And right. very often that is run or release or shake or tremor or cry yes or do any of those things that their bodies need to do to release the cortisol and adrenaline that's been stuck in their nervous system sometimes for 20 30 40 years right and i think you know sometimes that's called and i think this, this belittles it because i think it's so much more powerful than this holding space right that phrase because that to me uh, that phrase, you know, I'm holding space is, 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 it, 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 it's, it's very, very crucial. Right. And it, it, it's, 
because that's where the magic happens, isn't it? And yeah. I think, and then there's a very interesting distinction I'll share with you, see what you think about this. So in the ICF, International Coaching Federation, there's this thing about w- what a coach should do and be and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, and one of the things it says is, and I won't get this exactly right, but it says something like the coach must believe that the client has all the resources they need in order to be successful, right? And what, how I see that very differently now is I don't believe that. I don't believe that. I know that. I know. It doesn't mean they're presenting that at the moment. Right? No. They could be in all sorts. They of haven't stuff. got access. Yeah. 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 The capacity. That's not a belief. I'm not believing that. I see that the nature of what we are is that has that. Yeah. Again, as we know, people can get wounded and they can be in a, in a low, you know, it doesn't mean they're always going to be showing it. They may not, they may not have ever in their life have a sense of that, but, but I know they have that. Yes. But I'm also not going to go, oh, you've got that. What you want, what are you whining about your life for? Right. It's about helping them see that, but it's not believing it. And I think this is why it's so interesting. When I see it, it says believe. And I would have tried to, in the old days, I would have believed it. I would have believed my clients were resourceful. Now I just see it, right, as a possibility and a potential for them. And I think when you sit in that space, just deep down knowing that, without even having to say or manifest anything about that, but you just know that, people get a hit of that. They get a hit of that, which is what you're saying. They're paying you for your your nervous system. I like that. Um, and it's not about, oh, I really hope you do, you know, it's not about hope or about anything like that. You just see it. And you can hold that space for them to discover that and the safety of the non judgmentalness. Because whatever's turning up for us in our lives, yes, of course, there's going to be huge consequences for that. But in one level, it doesn't matter. Because what you truly are is not broken underneath all of that. It might look like it is, but whatever's going on in the weather, the sky is fine, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, the weather can't break the sky. No, no. So, so we are the sky and we get clouds and yes. we get rain and we get, you know, snowstorms. Yes. Uh, but we are the sky and yes. just like we are you know the gaps between thought that yes. is consciousness yes but it's at what point you say to somebody you're not that this is what you are and you know when in the journey you start to bring it in that actually they are the diamond You know, the diamond is at the core of who we all are. You know, there is a diamond at the essence in our, and maybe I like to think of it in our heart, you know, because that diamond just gets covered over with a bit of shit and grime and dust and crap. And, you know, our jobs really is that we are diamond shiners. Yeah. A- absolutely we're getting them to recognize that they are the diamond not yeah. all the other weapons yeah. on top yeah and i think yeah and i and it, and absolutely so i think it's what's interesting isn't it so so the more i talk with you the more i think actually yeah, we are you know very very similar and what we're pointing yeah. the, the, <laughs> the, the the two differences are one the type of clients that you're working with and are at quite a different place to most of mine yeah uh, well right and and do you think then that this might be a bigger bigger subject but the ch- what we talk to children about what we educate our children about because if if children and this is what i try to do with my kiddies is point them to the fact that yes there's going to be all sorts of things that are, they're going to get upset about and not like when they're you know but that's okay because it's not what they are. Whatever anxiety you might have, it's cool. It's fine. Have a sadness. You, you, you know, it's okay because that's it, it, that's just presenting itself. It's not what you are, but you can have those things, right? Um, and I do a varyingly good and bad job of doing that, depending on how I'm going. Um, but do, do you think it would make a big difference if we started talking to kids about this in a different way? 
I think it would make a massive difference. And I'm all for looking at this differently because then I think that they would get to where you're pointing to much earlier and much quicker. I think, Lou, if we're kind of coming back round, um, so remember we're doing a podcast here. Um, <laughs> if we're, <laughs> like we have the edit button. Um, if we come back round, you know, the, the language that you and I would use would be quite different. Where we are meeting people on this journey, if there is such a thing, is quite different. And I think we may have slightly different groundings on how upstream we point and how direct we are in that pointing. But I think a lot of what we're pointing to is in essence quite similar as well. Now, we may have nuanced differences on on the extensity of that, but I think there's a lot of similarity in what we're doing, and although we're working in different areas. So that, that's really lo been lovely to explore with you, Luz. Yeah. I, I really appreciate you coming on to have that chat, uh, because social media is not a great place to uh, try and explore something. I sometimes deliberately on, on social media do put out something to promote a conversation yeah otherwise, you do you really just, well because it always gets me going <laughs> well otherwise you just fall into the echo chamber of yeah blah exactly and for me the, the the richness is in the exploring and the and the conversation not in about the question i ask or even the answer i give it's in it's in it's in the, the richness of the exploration yep yeah i hear you um because the language is really can send us off into into all sorts of coldy sacks can't it yeah um, totally can totally can maybe we could do a part two or a deeper dive or a we could oh, an afterthought session yeah. and just keep the dialogue open and the discussion going because mm. i think it's fascinating I, i'd like to do that and i think you're right i think this will be an emergent evolving one it's, it'd be really interesting for, for me. So I've enjoyed it. I really appreciate where you're coming from to see this, the similarities, the differences in language and, and where we're at the journey. So brilliant. Let, let's do that. I've Thank exploring you for with asking you. me. Thank you. No, no. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. So listeners, really hope you enjoyed that conversation. Now, we'd love to make this as interactive and as much as a conversation as possible. So if you feel inclined, why don't you just drop us a note, maybe ask a question, leave us a comment or an insight about this episode or about anything that we talk about on Quality of Mind. We'd love this to be more interactive, more of a dialogue, explore it with you. And you can do that in various ways and all the details on how to do that are in the show notes. So please come on in and join the conversation. And as usual... Have fun being curious and keep exploring. Catch you on the next episode. If you enjoyed listening to this podcast and want to know more, check out our website at qualityofmind.biz and also feel free to reach out and leave us a review or a comment. Until next time, have fun being curious. <laughs>